Okay, well, welcome everybody to, uh, welcome back to the ATI seminar series. Um, we're uh, lucky today to have um, uh, Dr. Excuse me, Michael McGinnis joining us from um, Toronto. Today, I will just start uh, with a land acknowledgement that the University of Alberta acknowledges we're on Treaty 6 territory and we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Nation peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And uh, I'd also just like to, as always, thank Paladin, Estellas, and AstraZeneca for the support of, uh, of this series. Um, so, so with that, yeah, I'd like to introduce um, Michael. Michael and I met at uh, ICHLT um, this past year in, in April, and I, I saw his talk actually on uh, chrono, chronic thrombal ball coronary hypertension, but we got to talking about his work in lung transplant imaging. Um, and Toronto is a great center to study that. And, and um, I mean, I guess, depending on what your, what your point of view is, but they, they do so much imaging. Toronto will do um, CT scans at six weeks, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. So you can really study and follow the trajectory of imaging changes in lung transplant recipients. So, um, so Michael's really in an ideal position. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of, about his background. Um, he obtained his, M his MD from the U of T uh, and then went on to complete residency in diagnostic imaging at McGill and then uh, subspecialized in chest radiology with a one-year uh, fellowship at uh, the Mass General in Boston. Um, so Dr. McGinnis is a thoracic radiologist now at the Toronto General Hospital as an assistant professor um, appointment with the University of Toronto and clinical research interests, as mentioned, are in, in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but more relevant to his talk today is imaging of, uh, of lung transplants. So, um, so thanks again very much for joining us, uh, Michael. I'm excited to see this talk and and take it away when you're ready. Uh, the talk today is on imaging of lung transplantation, focus on CLAD. And um, I didn't want to talk like an hour on just on CLAD. Um, I don't know that much about CLAD to talk an hour about and get into the nitty gritty details of it. So we'll. We'll do CLAD, but we'll also talk about some non-CLAD causes of lung function decline. And uh, if you are doing any kind of CLAD work, you'll be running into these uh, phenomena anyway. Um, uh, my conflicts of interest are not really relevant to today's talk, uh, more related to uh, some ILD uh, work with Boring or Ingelheim and AstraZeneca, nothing specific for lung transplant, and I will not discuss any off-label use of drug devices uh, or devices during my presentation. So um, I've given kind of variations of these kinds of talks in lung transplant and broadly our learning objectives will, we will look at pictures of lung transplants and try to find pictures that are normal and abnormal. We'll look at some of the common complications of lung transplant on CT uh, that are not CLAD but could be mistaken for CLAD in terms of the patient's um, clinical status or spirometry. Um, and then uh, we will look at uh, CLAD in specific and decide uh, when CT may be appropriate. Like uh, Kieran said, we do a lot of CT, but you may be a little more judicious in your use. And uh, maybe what kind of tests you can do at the time of that CT to help uh, differentiate whether or not your patient has CLAD or will go on to have CLAD or what their prognosis uh, might be. So uh, in an hour, I can't really cover everything about lung transplantation, and there are a number of review articles out there that are radiology focused. And this would be one from Radiographics in 2021. And uh, Radiographics is kind of the premier radiology-based review journal, kind of like our European Respiratory Review kind of thing. Um, it only produces uh, review articles, and they're very heavy on pictures, so you can look at this article or you can look at other articles and just peruse the images and the figure legends and some of the text, depending on what kind of detail you want to go into. Some of the things um, I'm not going to talk about at all, like primary graft dysfunction, not even going to mention it. So this will be incomplete. Um, like Karen had mentioned, I'm from Toronto General Hospital. Uh, I'm from a group of radiologists called the Joint Department of Medical Imaging, and we cover Toronto General, Toronto Western, and Princess Margaret, which many of you will know will encompass the UHN or University Health Network. Uh, 
And then um, our Department of Medical Imaging also provides services for Women's College Hospital, which is really just down the street. And that happens to be where my office is. And uh, Sinai Health or Mount Sinai Hospital, which is across the street from Toronto General. And uh, all of that is under the umbrella of University of Toronto. And of course, they also have St. Michael's and Sunnybrook and others. <clears throat> uh, I was giving this or a similar talk yesterday and um, at Massachusetts General Hospital, where I did my fellowship, they invited me down to give a talk on lung transplant because I had been giving it at another meeting and my old uh, preceptor had heard or whatever. Now, most of you or many of you may already be aware of the history of lung transplantation, and it was particularly relevant for when I was down in Boston uh, yesterday. You can see I'm still trying to wake up. <laughs> I, I made a little vacation of it in Cape Cod. And unfortunately, there was that hurricane, which kind of came pretty close to Cape Cod, but it was okay in the end. But uh, Joel Cooper, he was the man to do the first successful lung transplantation in 1983 at Toronto General Hospital. But all of his training was at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard University. And then he got recruited by Griffith Pearson, kind of the father of thoracic surgery, uh, to go work at Toronto General Hospital. And that's, I guess, where he honed his skills and managed to do the first successful lung transplant in 1983 and double lung transplant in 1986 in patients with pulmonary fibrosis and cystic fibrosis, uh, respectively. And um, incidentally, I was giving a talk at, at UPenn back in February on quantitative CT, and I mentioned the lung transplant stuff. And I heard about Joel Cooper from one of my more senior colleagues who's still a radiologist and still working. He's into his late 70s, Gordon Weisbrod. And um, I heard stories about him, and I never imagined he'd still be around, but he was actually moderating the session back in February when I was at UPenn, and so I had the chance to meet the man, uh, which was great. So usually I give a little historical analogy, but in that case, I did not have to because I had the man himself right in front of me. Um, like Kieran had mentioned, we do a lot of CT scanning at Toronto General Hospital. I don't know why that is. Uh, I certainly find it helpful. They must find it helpful. Um, but if you go and look in the literature, you don't find really much recommendations for when you should perform your CT scans. Uh, our CT scans are performed without intravenous contrast. They're performed with a low dose uh, in contrast to other CTs. We perform our CT scans with inspiratory and expiratory imaging. Uh, so they take a deep breath in and hold their breath and they pass through the scanner. And then they breathe all the way out and hold it out and they pass through the scanner again and we get the two sets of images, breathing in and breathing out. We process our CT scans with thin sections. We acquire very thin images, and that's helpful for looking at very small structures like small airways. And then the images come over in a mediastinal and lung kernel. And that is to say they look kind of prepared, like one is you know very bright white like the lung, and one is very kind of grayish like the mediastinum or the heart. And then we have various kinds of multiplanar reformats or post-processing techniques. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what the dose is, the dose really is minimal and probably of no concern in a lung transplant patient given their expected survival. The dose on average of these lung transplant patients is around one and a half millisieverts, including the inspiratory and expiratory technique. And one and a half millisieverts is around um, somewhere around a third ish of your annual dose of just background radiation and probably around a third to a quarter of a standard dose CT, and probably somewhere like a sixth or something of a more intense CT, like a CT pulmonary angiogram of the chest with contrast enhancement. So we perform six of these CTs, but added up all together, it's really not a lot of radiation. Uh, so we perform our CTs at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months post-transplant. Uh, ideally, the patient comes back to Toronto General for their CT, but as you probably know, we get referrals from all across the country, and um, not all these patients can come back to Toronto General. And then they'll also get CT scans as clinically indicated, of course, if your patient has some kind of decline in lung function or other symptomatology. And the CT scan lines up roughly when the patients get their bronchoscopy, with the exception of now Toronto General does a bronch at one month, 
but then they follow the CT schedule, 3, 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, and of course, as, as needed. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I can't really speak much about this. These, these graphs are for um, radiologists, non-respirologists, or other general clinicians. But the monitoring of the lung transplant patients is done by serial spirometry. And uh, what they do, of course, is they measure the patient's lung function. And here I show the patient's FEV1 on the y-axis and um, then time on the x-axis. And this is arbitrary. Now, uh, I said that there's no good evidence out there, or not evidence, but societal recommendation about when to do your CTs. But in 2019, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation in their state consensus statement on CLAD said that patients should have a CT scan six months after their lung transplant, and that is to serve as their baseline. So six months after they had their transplant done, some kind of arbitrary number, six months later, they get a CT scan. Now we, we at TGH, we would have already done one in three months at six months at nine and 12, but at a minimum, you should do some kind of baseline and arbitrarily they pick six months. Now, um, the patient's lung function over, over time will show a number of declines, and this is a completely fabricated chart. Um, there's always some noise. Uh, but you may want to consider doing a CT scan when the patient's lung function, or in this case, their FEV1, drops by at least 10% from what their baseline is. And the baseline is the average of their two best measures. So I just put here as 100%. So if their lung function declines somewhere between the 10 to 20% range, that time point is called potential CLAD or potential rejection. We'll just say rejection here. Potential CLAD, they've had a drop in their lung function. They might or might not develop CLAD. You may want to do a CT scan. The next time point where you'll send your patient for a CT scan or where I will see them, aside from the routine surveillance, is when the patient has a more significant drop in their lung function, and that is to say uh, greater than 20%. And that time point where the lung function has dropped by greater than 20%, that is called um, possible CLAD. And I can never remember which one's potential CLAD, which one's possible CLAD, probably doesn't matter too much, but there's, you do a baseline CT, you may do a CT at the time of potential CLAD, although that's a little more controversial, you should definitely do a CT at the time of possible CLAD where there's a very significant drop in lung function. And then the last time where um, you'll image your patient uh, is when the patient has definite CLAD. And that is to say where the patient's lung function has declined and not only has it declined, but then it has declined and there's a sustained decline or a sustained reduction in their lung function. And at that point, if the lung function does not, you know, reverse, uh, then the patient is termed to have definite CLAT. And the CT scan at that time point is helpful for figuring out what phenotype of CLAT did they have, what kind of variety, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> um, this is the flow chart that's provided in the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantations um, consensus statement on the workup of patients with CLAD from 2019. And again, a lot of this doesn't concern CT, but from my perspective, you can see at the very top, they first deal with patients who have a 20% or greater decline in lung function from their baseline. And I've shown you that on the chart. And you perform investigations. And I'm not privy to a lot of the investigations, but I do know about CT. And um, the job of CT at that time point where the lung function has acutely or subacutely declined, the job of the CT scan is to really rule out non-clad causes of lung function decline. Take a look at the CT and see is there anything else on the CT scan aside from clad or rejection that can account for the patient's decline in lung function. And I give you a list, but I'm gonna show you pictures. Pictures are better than words. Well, in my, in my opinion. Uh, so the first part of the talk here, I guess this is the second part, we'll talk about just non-clad causes of lung function decline. So things that can make your lung function decline or the patient becomes unwell that is not clad. 
And um, this talk is supposed to be focused on CLAD, so we'll just skip through. Uh, the first step is how do you even know that the patient has a lung transplant? And here, this is a frontal and a lateral radiograph, or that is to say a chest X-ray of a 31-year-old woman, five years post-transplant for cystic fibrosis. And I've seen a lot of chest X-rays, and to me, this looks normal or nearly normal. And the only signature of the patient having a lung transplant in this case is that if you look closely, there are three sternal wires. And on the second panel, there are three vertical uh, vertical wires um, projecting over the mid sternum. That's called a clamshell sternotomy. And at least in Toronto, how they do the lung transplant is they make a transverse incision across the chest, and that's the blue dashed line, and they open up the chest like a clam. Okay. Most um, big sternotomies, like open heart surgery, they open the chest like a book, but um, for lung transplants, they open like a clam. And the telltale sign of having a lung transplant, therefore, are these three surgical wires. And this kind of approach for an operation is very rarely used for any other indication, although very rare, but I have encountered it. <clears throat> um, the sternum in the patients with a clamshell sternotomy, very rarely does it ever heal perfectly. It always looks a little abnormal. And in this 73-year-old woman, two years post-transplant for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you can see that uh, she has a sternum here there is a metallic sternal wire, which is that very dense kind of ring-shaped structure, and that the two fragments of the sternum don't line up perfectly. There's a little bit of a step, and that's perfectly expected. It never looks nice. But you can contrast that with another patient uh, from TGH, where they have a sternum, and then they have a sternotomy wire, which is that very dense thing on this CT scan image. And surrounding the sternal wire, the bone actually looks destroyed. You can see the bone comes down and it ends, and then there's a gap, and then the sternal wire. And then there's actually some abnormal tissue behind the sternum, which is the area of the asterisk. And this patient has osteomyelitis. Uh, osteomyelitis is an uncommon complication of lung transplant, but we certainly do see it. And it's usually a bacterial infection probably unlikely to cause a lung function decline, although sternal problems certainly can, and other bony rib cage problems can. Um, <clears throat> one of the main problems in lung transplantation is the airways and the airway anastomosis. And uh, so that's an area that could also produce a lung function decline that is not clad. Uh, at Toronto General, and largely, I think um, this is largely the approach now, is that the donor and recipient bronchus are sewn together end to end. So they just take one tube and, and sew it to the other tube end to end. And I show you the area, the, the arrows showing the areas of the bronchial anastomosis, and it's really barely appreciable on this CT scan image because the anastomosis usually looks really nice and very difficult to detect radiologically. Historically, I think uh, telescoping anastomosis was more common and that is to say where they take the donor bronchus and the intussuscept it into the recipient bronchus. And you end up with some little abnormalities on the CT image, like in this second patient here, where there's a little thing protruding into the airway. There's a little slip here along the inferior margin of the uh, bronchus. And uh, that can mimic pathology, but uh, that kind of anastomosis has, I think, largely been abandoned. Common airway problems, and this is from a meta-analysis just in the last, I think, month or two in the Journal of Heart Lung Transplant is uh, stenosis, uh, about 8% of patients. That would be the incidence in this meta-analysis that had, I think, 50,000 patients, a large number. And that occurs on average around 90 days. Uh, not to say that the stenosis decides to occur at 90 days, but patients get a bronchoscopy and a CT scan around 90 days, and then, aha, they discover it. <laughs> Um, more severe complications like a dehiscence are more rare, and those in that case tend to occur earlier. The bronchial anastomosis is a problem, um, and it's really because the bronchi uh, are not well uh, perfused in the donor lung. Uh, you lose the bronchial arterial circulation, and uh, so then I guess the donor bronchus is reliant on uh, backflow from the pulmonary artery circulation, and so it never really is quite as good um, as the uh, in the uh, the donor uh, to begin with. 
And uh, so it takes a while, I guess, for the uh, perfusion to improve. And so there's relative ischemia and the ischemia leads to complications. Risk factors are uh, male donors, uh, male recipients, uh, trouble in the perioperative period, um, that telescoping anastomosis rather than the end-to-end -end anastomosis. Um, here's an example of a problem that might result in a lung function decline, although this is not severe. It's a 19-year-old man with cystic fibrosis two months post-transplant, and the big black arrow is pointing to a filling defect in the left main bronchus. The left main bronchus is the long black tube. Um, I'm just going to put on my um, laser pointer and, and hopefully you can see it better now. Uh, so that's the left main bronchus. And then there's a big black arrow that's usually a sign of pathology in the radiology literature. And it shows a defect in the left main bronchus. And on bronchoscopy that was performed around the same time, you can see that there's a stenosis of the anastomosis. You can tell it's the anastomosis because there are staple, not staple lines, but suture lines, sorry. And then all this white stuff here, or pale stuff, is granulation tissue. Um, and then I think one of the last things is before we get into CLAD is you have to know what the normal transplant lung looks like. And um, you have to know because it doesn't look normal. Normal post-transplant is not normal kind of baseline physiologic state. And so here's another 19-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who underwent lung transplant. And his CT was done three weeks post-transplant. I don't remember the precise indication. Usually we would not do it. Um, but you can see that his transplant left lung, which is this structure here, it's abnormal. It has a little too much what we call interlobular septal thickening, or there are too many lines. It's like someone drew a bunch of lines, scribbled a bunch of lines on my CT scan. And that represents edema in the lung. And so initially the transplant lungs are edematous. And the patient also has pleural fluid. And that is all this white stuff here, uh, inferiorly or posteriorly in this patient's left chest. And you can see there's fluid pushing the lung away from the ribs, which are these big white structures here. So edema in the lung and pleural effusions or some pleural hematoma is very common early in the post-transplant period. And if we look at the same man two months post-transplant, you can see how much nicer it's looking. You're not radiologists, but probably a lot of you can appreciate that these lungs are nicer than those lungs because that pleural fluid has disappeared. And although to my eye, there are a few too many lines in this lung, it looks much better than this lung here. And the lung volume has improved. The lungs are getting bigger, that's, that's better. And then patients after years, um, their x-ray will often look a little abnormal. And if you're not a radiologist and you look at this x-ray, you may say, well, okay, it looks pretty normal to me, but there are some subtle abnormalities like down here in the patient's right costophrenic angle and some stuff along the right hilum. But that is to say that um, patients will often be left with mild abnormalities in their lung. But the main thing that we're looking for is that the imaging appearance improves over time, that things are getting better and not worse. Things won't get normal, but they will continue to get better. That's probably a principle in most transplants, not just lung. Here's a 23-year-old man, and um, he's in his first year post-retransplant for cystic fibrosis, and I show you two images of his lung. And on the first image, which is kind of hidden back here, he has this white spot, which we would call a consolidation or a consolidative nodule, and it's in his costophrenic angle, that is to say the space between his diaphragm and his rib cage. If you look at his left lung, which is the second image, you can see that there's this band opacity in the left lower lobe. That's this big white broad band. And then the lung here generally, I'm just going to say looks dirty. But, you know, yesterday when I was talking to the radiologist, I would have said central lobular ground glass opacity and mucus plugging. Um, contrast, this is an abnormal appearance with these new findings. And here's a 71-year-old man, and he's 12 months post single lung transplant for COPD. You can see um, his right lung, which is on the left side of your screen, is abnormal. It's emphysematous, and that is to say it's too black. It's full of holes, full of holes, not normal. And in the posterior aspect, there's all this opacity or white stuff, and that's consolidation or pneumonia. Uh, 
And then in his transplant left lung, his left lung looks a little dense to me. And then posteriorly here, again, it looks very dirty. We call this haziness ground glass opacity and the more dense stuff consolidation. The man on the left, the 23 year old, he had pseudomonas pneumonia. And the man on the right, um, the 71 year old man had cytomegalovirus uh, pneumonia. And those are two of the common culprits for pneumonia in patients with lung transplant, bacterial and viral infections. Um, <clears throat> here's another example of infection, and these could also cause lung function decline. Here's a 64-year-old man uh, on the left, and he has hemoptysis, that is to say coughing up blood, for two years after having a single lung transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. His left lung, which is uh, on the right side of your screen, is the fibrotic lung, and I don't show you a good image of the fibrosis. Just trust me, the lung looks relatively small and it's a bit hazy. You gotta trust your radiologist, I guess. And then uh, his right lung has this abnormality at the right apex. Probably most of you can spot that. There's something rounded here, kind of looks like a bullseye. And uh, this was aspergillus infection. And aspergillus infection, that's a fungal infection. It has a propensity to form these cavities with these fungus balls in the middle of them. And as it causes cavitation in the lung, the patients can present with hemoptysis or coughing up blood because it communicates with the airways. Contrast that with this 28-year-old woman. She's five years post-transplant for cystic fibrosis. And you can see she has consolidation in her middle lobe and a bunch of central lobular ground glass nodules. She had a very abnormal aorta with a pseudoaneurysm. She was septic. She had candidal infection with candidemia. And so aspergillus and candidal infection are the common fungal infections. A couple more slides. Here's a 32-year-old with a spot in the right lower lobe. Here's a 70-year-old man with a spot in the middle lobe. These patients had post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. That's another complication of lung transplant. 1% at one year, 4% at 10 years. And then here's another one that I biopsied. And uh, she had a mass in the right upper lobe, ground glass and solid. She was 11 years post-transplant for COPD, got a PET scan. We did the biopsy, showed adenocarcinoma. Patients with lung transplant are at a 7% or seven-fold increased risk of uh, cancer compared to the general population. Common cancers are PTLD. In this case, uh, there's head and neck cancer, and here there's adenocarcinoma of the lung. Those would be the top three culprits. And then the last thing, I think this is the last thing before we talk about CLAD specifically, is uh, this is a patient with a rare disease called pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, PAP, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And he got a lung transplant for it. You can see his pre-transplant lung looks very abnormal. And then at two years post-transplant, he had some stuff showing up in the lung. These are ground glass opacities, we say. And at five years, you can see that he has even more of that. And this patient has recurrence of his native lung disease in his transplant lung. The most common indications for lung transplant are things like COPD or emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis. And those tend not to recur in the transplant lung. But things like pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, sarcoidosis, and lymphangioliomimotosis, which are uncommon indications for lung transplant, but those can all recur in your, uh, in your allograft. So keep an eye out for those. Now, uh, I mentioned a lot of complications that you can have in the lung, and um, early on, a lot of those are associated with morbidity and mortality. Over the long term, the major cause of death or lung allograft failure is CLAT, chronic lung allograft dysfunction. And I'm not entirely sure um, who's in the audience, but many of you probably know that the median survival for lung transplant is only around six years. And you can see this is from the ISHLT's annual report last year, but you can see that over the decades, survival has not been improving by any great extent. Um, really not at all, just kind of modest improvements in survival. So the principal cause of lung allograft failure, once we get through all those other things that are important to know about and could mimic CLAD, is really chronic lung allograft dysfunction or chronic rejection. And there are two main kinds of CLAD that we would talk about in a modern sense. And one is obstructive CLAD and restrictive CLAD. The obstructive is called bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, and we'll call it BOS here on out, B-O-S. And then the restrictive syndrome is called restrictive allograft syndrome, and that's RAS is what we'll call it. 
And then a 2019 consensus report, which I'll reference a lot and already have, expands on those and provides some definitions. We've already seen this slide of when you will be doing CT imaging in your patients with CLAD or suspected CLAD or potential or possible or definite CLAD, if you want to use the terminology they refer to. We already talked about the importance of excluding non-CLAD causes of lung function decline, presuming that you don't find any of those or that you found some, but you treated, but their lung function is still poor. The patient moves through the flow chart and ends up with having definite CLAD. That is to say they have a greater than 20% decline in their lung function, and they've had it for more than three months. At that time point, they're coming back to me for another CT scan. And I'm going to do the same kind of CT, a low dose with inspiratory and expiratory technique. And I'm going to look at the imaging appearance of that CT and try to decide, in addition to the physiologic evidence provided to me, but radiographically, does the patient have imaging evidence of BOS or imaging evidence of RAS? And you can see there are a few other possibilities too that I put in small font. Bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome is the one that we know the most about because it's the most earliest described. And here you can see a report from Cooper in, two, oh, sorry, in 1993. And the hallmark of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome is air trapping. Bronchiolitis obliterans, obliteration of the airways. And as the airways are obliterated, then the lung cannot get the air out fast enough. The air is trapped in the lung because the highway out, the airways are occluded. This is why we do inspiratory and expiratory CT. On the inspiratory CT, the lung looks normal or near normal. You'd have to be quite, look quite good or looking quite closely to find abnormalities. On the expiratory CT, you can see that the lung looks very heterogeneous. That is to say there are alternating areas of dense lung and alternating areas of low density lung. And all the low density lung is the areas where the air can't get out when the patient breathes out the air stuck in the lung. <clears throat> the other um, main phenotype is called restrictive allograft syndrome, and there are varying kind of early reports of this phenomenon. This is one from our group from Gordon Weisbrod before I started working in 2003. And he um, and his colleagues titled an article in AJR, that's one of our radiology journals. Uh, the title was Fibrosis of the Upper Lobes, a Newly Identified Late Onset Complication After Lung Transplantation? Question mark. And uh, you can see they show an image of a 60 year old woman who's four years post-transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. You can see her right lung, that's her native lung, is fibrotic, and her transplant left lung looks normal or near normal. But then you can see at the seven-year mark, that is to say three years after the image on the left, she's developed fibrotic features. And that is to say she has too many lines in her lung, and her transplant lung is becoming smaller. It's fibrosing. There's restrictive lung disease. The lung is shrinking. Okay. And all of these little white bands that we see that we didn't see before, those correspond to fibrosis. Um, those are good representations. Here are some more classic imaging appearance of restrictive allograft syndrome. The areas of fibrosis tend to be in the upper lung zones. And you can see that in the 72-year-old man, three years post-transplant for COPD. You can see that on this coronal reformat, all of his upper lung looks very abnormal, and it's very small, it's very white or dense, and his lower lung looks relatively normal. And this man has what we would call a PPFE pattern or a pleuroparenchymal fibroastosis. He has fibrosis in his lung, and he also has this thickening or fibrosis in the pleura. Contrast that with a 69-year-old woman two years post-transplant, also for COPD, she has similar features with abnormalities or too many markings in the upper lungs, um, but it's not as extreme as the 72-year-old. Uh, Some patients can have a mixed pattern. We can have, not only do they have chronic lung allograft dysfunction of a RAS phenotype, but they also have bronchiolitis obliterans. And so here's a 59-year-old woman and she has fibrosis in the upper lung zones. You can see it on the axial image, which is the one on your right. But if I look at the airways at her lung bases, she has bronchial wall thickening, she has central ocular nodules, and she may even have a little bit of bronchiectasis, and those are the hallmarks of BOS. When they do um, explants and they look at lungs that have RAS, they often find BOS as well. They find the two pathologies coexist. But on imaging, they are usually more one phenotype than the other. Now, the um, consensus document here 
goes through a little chart and you can see that they look at the patient's physiologic obstruction, their restriction, and then importantly, they look at CT opacities. And depending on the presence or absence of CT opacities, that's usually to mean the upper lung zone, the ones that look like RAS, they use that to help phenotype the patient. In addition to BAS, RAS, and MIX, there's also people who are undefined and also people who may be unclassified by this particular scheme because the scheme's not perfect yet. Uh, so we know the most about BAS and RAS. And if you want to know more, um, there are a number of review articles out there. This one's from 2021 in Radiology Cardiothoracic Imaging from the Vancouver Group. <clears throat> what do we know about patients with potential CLAD? when we image them with just that modest reduction in their lung function. This is um, a tool called parametric response mapping. I'll see if I can get it to play. Maybe I have to uh, turn off my laser pointer. And uh, what they do, um, oh, well, I don't think I can get it to play, but that's okay. Um, what they do is they take an inspiratory CT and an expiratory CT, and they digitally subtract the two. And by digitally subtracting the two, they can figure out how much of the lung has air trapping versus how much of the lung is breathing in and out normally versus how much of the lung actually has some densities in it, some areas that are too dense to begin with. And this was done by Viva Lama at Michigan with Craig Galbin, who's a professor of radiology there, and Ella Kazruni, who's a thoracic radiologist. And what they found in their perspective study in the Blue Journal is in patients who have that modest decline in lung function, when they do their parametric response mapping test, which is really the same kind of CT we do, but they do additional post-processing, they found patients who had that normal parametric response signature, they on average went around two years before they developed CLAS. So it was actually quite protective. And then they found that patients who had air trapping and they had patients who had parenchymal disease or ground glass opacities assessed by the machine or even just abnormalities noted by the radiologist, Ella Kazaruni, they found that those patients on average went on to develop definite CLAD within five or six months. So CT is a very powerful tool when your patient does have a lung function decline. One thing you can do is just have your radiologist look at it and say, do you see ground glass opacities in the CT that are new? or you can run through a fancy machine and have a similar outcome in an automated fashion. What about patients who have possible CLAD? That is to say they have a more substantial drop in their lung function. Well, we looked at this group in particular here at Toronto General, we took around 88 CT scans of patients who had a CT very close to the time of their lung function decline in a retrospective fashion. And on average, it was around seven days after their CLAD onset. So around seven days after their measured 20% drop in lung function with a certain window. And you can see here are nine selected images from nine different patients in the cohort. And you don't have to be a radiologist to say that all of these look a little different. None of the two look the same. And so there are many different patterns of lung injury going on that are being captured by the CT scan. We used a couple of radiologists, and we also used a machine learning trained texture analysis tool to process the CT scans. And that is to say that the CT gets classified as being normal, which would be green lung, being abnormally loosened or having too much air or potentially air trapping, that would be blue lung, or lung that has reticulation, which would be orange lung, and lung that has ground glass opacity or infiltrate, and that would be yellow. And when you look at those ADA patients and you look at their CT scan results, you can see, again, just what we saw on the last slide, that it looks like a very heterogeneous group of patients. Each circle here represents a CT scan, and the more green the circle is, the more normal the CT is, and the more yellow it is, the more ground glass it is, et cetera. But when you group the CT scans by um, patient's ultimate clinical phenotype down the road, you can see that patients with bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome early on in their course, they present mostly as normal CT scans or CT scans with lots of air trapping. And very few of them have significant parenchymal infiltrates, but some of them will. And then if you look at the patients with the other kinds of CLAD, like restrictive allograft syndrome or the mixed phenotypes, they look more colorful. They have more opacities in the lung. And this was similar results with our, you know, our texture analysis tool, but also just our radiologist scoring the CT scans. They both did about the same. And we found that all of these opacities were prognostic in patients. 
the patients with the most opacities, and here I'm just showing you reticulation, that's the RET. I'm just showing you it divided by tertiles in the survival curve. You can see that the patients in the highest reticulation tertile had the poorest survival after their CLAD onset, and the patients with very little reticulation survived longer. And that was independent of the patient's CLAD ultimate phenotype, their age, sex, native lung disease, CMV status. Uh, UCLA was doing a very similar thing with half the number of patients that we published within, I think, two months of each other, just coincidentally. Um, here's an example of the CT analysis tool, what it does, and we didn't create it. This is actually it's commercialized, but there are many kind of tools out there like the UCLA or like this one. It takes the lung, it segments it into the right lung and the left lung. It colors the lung to decide, you know, how much of the lung is abnormal or normal, and it really sees things beyond our perception. And then it also does things like quantify how many blood vessels there are or what percentage of the lung do the blood vessels occupy. And one thing I won't get into here, but one of our strongest signatures of patient's prognosis and a phenotype was actually the patient's pulmonary vessel volume. And there may be a number of reasons for that, but pulmonary vessel volume is a biomarker that's being looked at in many diseases, most recently COVID. And in patients who are in inflammatory states, their pulmonary vessel volumes tend to increase, tend to increase. And we can capture that by CT. Um, what are a few other things we know in the last couple of minutes? Um, <clears throat> well, I told you we know everything about definite CLAD because that's what's been studied the longest really since the 90s. Um, but we're still learning new things. Uh, CLAD phenotype can switch. Not only could you be, you know, BOS or RAS or mixed, but you can start out as BOS and you can transition to RAS. And here are two reports. One of them here, the image here is from the Toronto group by Teresa Martinu, I think. And you can see on panel A that the patient has features of BOS, that is to say the lung is a little heterogeneous, but not a lot going on. And then in follow-up, the patient develops new ground glass opacities or new spots showing up in the lung. And that represents a transition from BOS to RAS. And when that happens, which is in around 10% of patients, their prognosis really declines. And that's shown here on the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. The red line is the patients who switch from BOS which in some cases could be more indolent, into RAS, which is more aggressive. Um, so here I showed you CT can be indicated at multiple time points and that we have a number of tools or we've learned a number of things recently. I'm just going to share a couple more things, some active research questions. Are single and double lung transplants similar CLAD onset? We looked at this. It's not published yet, but we presented at ISHLT in April. And we looked at 28 single lung transplants to our cohort of 88 double lung transplants. Of course, patients um, who get single lung transplants are a little older because they usually get it for IPF or pulmonary fibrosis, and that's usually a disease of old men. Um, but we found that similar to our double lung transplant work, we found that the single lung transplants, both the radiologist and both the texture analysis automated CT tool, can differentiate between the CLAD phenotypes, the patients with BOS and the patients with RAS. Patients with RAS tend to have many more opacities scored by the radiologist, and their pulmonary vessel volume tends to be much higher, about double that of the patients with BOS. And, um, <clears throat> well, I don't want to get into the details here, but um, the take-home point is really that patients with single lung transplants at CLAD onset it seems that at the time that they present on imaging, at least, they have more inflammation, they have more fibrosis, and they have a larger pulmonary vessel volume as a proportion of lung volume compared to double lung transplant patients. And that probably means that we're just picking them up later. And there's a number of reasons for that that some of you could probably postulate. Maybe they, they don't get sent to CT early enough because they're drop in lung function is somewhat obscured by having a native lung that's already diseased, so their spirometry is not as sensitive. And we can think of other things as well. Um, I don't do any MRI work, but this is um, an article I read from earlier this year, published in Radiology, which is a kind of our premier radiology journal. And they looked at MRI in about 140 patients out of Hanover, <clears throat> lung transplant patients, and then they followed to see who um, uh, who uh, had a CLAD-related death and who did not, and who developed CLAD and who did not. And one of the interesting things you can do with MRI, uh, just like you could do with parametric response mapping, but in a more 
elegant way, I suppose, in a more quantitative way, you can measure the patient's ventilation of their lung. And you can see here the panels in patient A and patient B. These are ventilation, and the first column is just in some arbitrary units. The second column is a flow volume loop. And you can see in patient A, uh, at their baseline, they have normal ventilation that is green. And then a follow-up, this patient ultimately develops BOS. And so they have poor ventilation in the periphery of their lung. They can also look at perfusion of the lung using MRI. And by looking at ventilation and perfusion, they can look to see how the two match or mismatch, VQ matching. The patient in B here, the patient B, they ended up being stable, and you can see their MRI stays stable over time. That's a promising tool. I don't know about the ventilation and perfusion. I had spoken to other people at UPenn, and what they can do is they can look at things like the thickness of the interstitium, the oxygenation, um, and I think that might be more interesting because to me, the early signatures of CLAD are probably opacities in the lung and thickening of the interstitium and perhaps blood vessel changes. And then the flow, the airflow limitations, really, I think, are the sequela of fibrosis after the inflammatory phase. But they can probably tease out some important stuff from this. Uh, we don't do any MRI of uh, the lung at Toronto General. Um, and then another research question I had, and I think this is my last slide here, just to leave some time for questions if there are any, is, um, you know, we have all of this imaging like Kieran had mentioned, and like I showed you at 3, 6, 9, 12, 18, 24. So patients before they develop CLAD, they um, will often have several CT scans. And uh, with one of my medical students, Grace Grafham, we looked at 130 or 140 patients who have a six month baseline CT. And we look to see if we do all of our imaging tests on that six-month CT, like we have the texture analysis tool, we look at the blood vessel volume and such. Is there anything on that six-month CT that we think predicts that the patient will down the road at one year or two years develop CLAD? And so far, we haven't found anything. Uh, we're going to present some negative results uh, at RSNA in November. Um, but we'll keep looking to see if there's signatures on the early CT that might identify patients with CLAD. Certainly, we do find that patients, when they do develop CLAD, their CT changes, and sometimes in a dramatic fashion, and that's what's being shown by these uh, plots here. But uh, unfortunately, we haven't discovered any early predictor. So um, uh, here are the learning objectives. I think I met most of them, but really in a cursory fashion. And um, I'm happy to entertain any, uh, any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Michael. This was a great overview, and it's great to see the work that you're doing, um, as well as others in uh, in quantitative analysis, particularly. So, I'm, I guess, my question, my first question, uh, maybe while other people are um, either putting their questions in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Um, you know, quantitative. We see more and more about quantitative analysis, uh, quantitative CT, quantitative imaging, um, and uh, you know, giving giving clinicians sort of a, a parametric readout of of changes as opposed to um, you know a radiologist's typical way of kind of grading it um, more qualitatively. Do you think that that is um, going to be ready for prime time in lung transplantation soon? Like, are are these tools um, going to be ready for deployment, or or do you feel like the performance characteristics of them are still um, are still not there where they can they can you know give us quantitative readouts. Oh yeah, well that's that's complicated. Um, I'll t I can talk to you about my experience with parametric response mapping, for example, the thing that they use in uh, Michigan, Craig Galpin, where they have the inspiratory CT and the expiratory CT, and they process the two together, and you get a, a readout saying your lung is thirty percent air trapping and seventy percent normal or maybe 5%, you know, dense infiltrate. Uh, the problem with that is it's really, um, uh, unless you've gone through the work to finally tune it, it's really susceptible to variations in the protocol, your CT protocol. And so um, if I do parametric response mapping on a CT from here versus a CT from Calgary versus from Michigan, um, it could be even the same patient, but on three different scanners, and I'll get three different results. 
And uh, so you really need to calibrate it to your site. And I've tried that with parametric response mapping here because I have access to one of the commercialized versions that was based on the Michigan um, protocol. And it doesn't work very well at all, in my experience. It's very variable. Some people will give wildly abnormal results when it's normal. And some people will say it's normal, but it's clearly abnormal. And so I stopped trying to use it. But if I put the time in, I could probably get it right. Um, but no way ready for prime time. But what I, I find, there are different ways you can approach with the imaging. But for me, it's about looking for clues of the pathophysiology of these diseases and maybe trying to identify the earliest kind of biomarkers of these disease uh, states. And so one thing I found really interesting was the pulmonary vessel volume change and also the identification of ground glass. I should mention in, in that parametric response mapping study where they had the PRM uh, to predict future cloud onset, they found that the radiologist looking just for ground glass opacity was just as good. And they also found that the presence or absence of air trapping scored by a radiologist had no predictive effect. And so we talk a lot about looking for air trapping and such. And, uh, you know, it's not really a good thing to look at. Um, and in our study, we found that of all the prognostic markers, we found that hyperlucent lung, you know, or the air trapping actually was not prognostic at all. And so for me, it represents a shift from thinking about the classic things like air trapping, upper lung zone fibrosis, and shifting to markers of kind of acute inflammation. It's interesting because, you know, those are, these are tools being developed to try to reduce um, inter-observer um, heterogeneity. And you're, you're sort of saying that they, they have their own intrinsic, you know, um, uh, calibration related heterogeneities, um, which is which introduces a real layer of complexity to them. So, you, you do you think they're they're going to basically stay investigational use and and not really ever be um, really clinically clinically deployed? Well, that's what that's what I would anticipate, and right. um, that's what I would anticipate. I mean, aside from deploying anything clinically, you know, it it can. Depending on your institute, it could take years to even add a button to your program. You know, it says so. so uh, you know, it may be a while, but like none of the things that I've I've talked about here, I don't think are really going to revolutionize how we interpret the transplants. But I think from what I'm reading, you know, some people are still they're chasing after air trapping, they're chasing after changes in ventilation in the lung, and I think we need to shift our thoughts from looking at that, which is the end effect of whatever process is going on, the inflammation. They're looking for the markers. The Mr. Bowl by that point, maybe. Yeah, it's like looking for metastases in a patient with cancer. You know, you want to you want to find the cancer early. I want to find, you know, what's happening in BOSS. I want to find it early. So we actually have a new study going on and we're looking at with instead of just kind of that average of seven days CT scan after the lung function decline, we're even tightening the window even further to try to get, you know, find cases that have imaging very, very close to the when the lung function declines and see what the signature is in the lung, what the pattern is of lung injury. That might give us a clue as to what is going on. I wanna pass on, we have most of our uh, physician group here and actually um, several of our surgical group here uh, among the audience. So I wanna pass on, apparently there's a problem uh, I don't know if everybody's having the problem with the text box, but uh, but Aline Herji, one of our physicians who you may have met, is um, was just to, uh, texted me a, a question that he wanted to ask. So, given the prevalence of diaphragmatic dysfunction post transplant, which can contribute to poor lung function, um, we're sort of starting to use uh, ultrasounds um, and diaphragm function tests or fluoroscopy to assess function. Does the CT um, help us with diaphragm health and atrophy, or um, is it, uh, do you need other modalities? Yeah, uh, well, we have a, one of the great things that we have here now is we have kind of a monthly cloud rounds where we discuss three or four uh, or five cases, usually, well, three or four if you plan, and then it turns out to be two cases. <laughs> you know how it is. These cases are so complicated, but that, that comes up a lot. And uh, CT has a fair number of limitations with looking at the CT, uh, looking at the diaphragm. Um, there are obviously things like, you know, your left diaphragm is usually not higher than your right. Your right diaphragm with the liver is usually higher than the left. If you're looking for a signs of diaphragmatic dysfunction, unfortunately, the CT tends not to be dynamic. Uh, 
although we do have inspiratory expiratory. But the thing that I find helpful to look at is the diaphragmatic crust. Um, so you look at the diaphragm as it inserts along the spine. And uh, we often have early imaging or late imaging of these patients. And you can see if the muscle is getting thinner over time or is very thin to begin with, you can see that the diaphragm is not functioning very well. The diaphragm will normally have a certain amount of thickness to it, a certain amount of juiciness, especially if there is a discrepancy between the two. So you can see atrophy of the diaphragm. But um, uh, I don't know how good we are with that, uh, with that sign. And um, we usually do something more dynamic, like an ultrasound, for example, or some kind of fluoroscopic test, a stiff test. But um, uh, so I do take a stab at it every time that I think it's something being considered, but I would not rely on, on diaphragm. Actually, yesterday I was talking to Suba de Gramarthi. He's one of the radiologists at MGH. He's the one that taught me that trick of the diaphragm dysfunction. It wasn't in a transplant patient, but I was in fellowship years ago. Um, I have another question. I don't want to walk over anybody else if they have questions. Um, so, you know, we, our, our program, I, I sort of refer to as we run lean on investigations um, and whether or not that's by external factors or by decisions, it, it varies. But our, our protocol here is just actually one CT at three months, and then we do yearly chest x-rays. Um, but we have very good survival. Our, our median survival probably is pushing um, up against 11 or 12 years now here. Uh, and some of that is doing, you know, mainly double lung transplants. But um, it's, it's interesting to me because I think about whether or not we're suffering by the absence of protocol scheduled CTs, uh, and whether or not we're missing anything or whether or not you know, could there be, um, you know, a, a false positive rate, which results in investigations, which, um, which aren't fruitful or which sometimes can put patients at risk. So what are, what are your thoughts on, if you would give a recommendation to us, you see a ton of these CTs come through in Toronto. Do you think that we should be doing more protocol CTs at, at more frequent time points? Or do you think that, um, you know, what, if, if you had to kind of write a guideline on, on uh, CT frequency post-transplant, uh, I would say the, I think the ICHLT got it probably correct in um, picking the six month rather than the three month. Uh, when I read the three month CTs, at least for the purposes of CLAD, I guess the three month is good. You may pick up on still kind of perioperative complications, airway complications on that three month CT. But in terms of serving as a baseline for CLAD, I think the six month is better than the three month. The three month, um, you know, often there's still some pleural fluid more interstitial thickening. Uh, the post-operative changes haven't always completely resolved. And I think the six-month CT is cleaner than the three-month. Um, but we do we do a lot of CT. I don't know how much of that is uh, truly necessary. The Obviously, the clinicians seem to find it useful. We don't kind of accidentally discover a CLAD. You know, the, usually by the time they're coming for a CLAD evaluation, they've had a drop in their lung function. Right. Um, so I, I can't speak to that, but I would say if, if I had to pick a time point for CLAD purposes, I would pick six months. If I was picking a time point for complications, like the stenosis of the airway, I would pick three months, right. uh, maybe three and six. And then, of course, I would suggest a CT when the patient's lung function does decline, and you suspect that they may have of course. Yeah. possible yeah. clinical indication. Um, I have to just give some final comments. Um, uh, Sida has uh, prompted me there. Uh, do you, does anybody have any final questions uh, for, for Michael? Okay, well, um, I really want to thank uh, you, Michael. This is fantastic, and um, I hope we uh, are able to stay in touch with you and you know, potentially collaborate if there are uh, you know, external validation or, or um, other uh, uh, collaborations you'd like to get involved in. Um, so just everybody join me in thanking Michael very much. Um, yeah. And applause, even though they're always lacking in Zoom. Well, well, thank you very much for the invitation, Kieran. It's really my pleasure. It's great to meet you. And it's great to meet the, your transplant group.